this is Ken from Let's Rock. How are yeah. things going? Great, great. It's been uh, it's been a long, long year for the band from the band perspective. Um, had a lot of fun in, per- in my personal life being home so much, but the, the waiting for this record to come out and all the different pitfalls we've had to go through to get it to completion and, and get it to a release date has been a bit of a pain in the ass. What uh, what pitfalls? Um, I think we, you know, we had the majority of the record done in last October, and um, we ended up having to sit with it over Christmas because of the whole music industry shutting down for six weeks, basically. Right. Unless you're like the Foo Fighters or Celine Dion, you really can't get anything done over the holidays. And uh, and I think that was way too much time for us to sit and dwell on the album. And we started second guessing ourselves and ended up deciding that we wanted to go back into the studio and do more songs. Which, at the end of the day, I think probably probably helped as much as it hurt us. So at the end, like, it really was kind of a wash, being that like, I do think we improved the album and added some stronger, um, some stronger singles onto the album by doing that. But at the end of the day, we lost so much time and traction from taking that six months that it was like it ended up costing us about six months in release date. Um, and you know, it, it's hurt us from a, a touring standpoint, a live standpoint, momentum standpoint, um, just everything. Kind of like all the all the, the price we had to pay for that decision was was one of those the juice isn't worth the squeeze type scenarios. Wow, that is uh, that's a long time. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, this, the, one of the songs we we recorded is is currently number four in, in Active Rock in Canada right now. So it's you know it's not a complete wash, but the, the band is hurting financially because we've been off the road for so long, and 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 then the morale is a bit down because we haven't been on tour since last June. And yeah, we just really we're just really interested to get back at it. I can imagine, and it's uh, I heard the album last night. It's fantastic. What a sound. Yeah, thanks. We we did do things a little differently this time. I was going to say that. Um, I mean, the style is very different. But the the main thing I noticed is um, the sound of your guitars were just incredible. Yeah, there's a pretty cool story behind that, actually. And that's the, the place that we recorded the album is the place that we've gone for the last two records, except this time we stayed there for much longer. And one of the amplifiers they have at that studio is one of only three in the world. The other two... Uh, well, one of them is in the Smithsonian, and the other one's at Eric Clapton's house. Huh. Um, yeah, and it's a, it's a it's a prototype uh, Marshall made in the fifties. It was like before Marshall was even Marshall, and they were building prototypes of what was what would eventually turn into the JTM model amp. Right. Um, and there's just some weird, crazy mojo about this head that just is absolutely. I mean, I'm not even a huge, like, I'm kind of a gear nut, but I'm, I'm very open to using a lot of different things, and, I'm, and they're all within the realm of the same type of idea, but there's something about this head that is different than everything else I've ever played through, and so we just get, a lot of the reason we, we go back there is to use this amp in addition to the fact that it's absolutely a beautiful studio and a great place to hang out for a month. Well, that, that sound you got is absolutely ripping. Like, it is, it is fantastic. No, okay, so... Cool. Like I said, the style is very different on this album from your previous albums. Is, right. this, is this a conscious effort, or is it just kind of what flows out when you start jamming? At the end of the day, I, I feel like there's a bunch of songs on the record that really would fit totally fine on our previous album. Uh, I think what really happened is that we ran a wider gamut across the entire album. So there's, you know, there's, I'd say, at least four or five songs on the record that you could easily just take and shift. Actually, at least two of them were written as part of the sit and heavy sessions that just ended up not getting completed in time and moved into this session. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, and then we actually did make a conscious choice to work on a bunch of different other styles and vibes just to try and push the, the limits of what we've done before and kind of create an album that wasn't, I think maybe one of the drawbacks from Curiosity and Sit and Heavy was the fact that we didn't vary up the style enough across the album. And in doing that, I think we maybe even possibly overcompensated on this album and tried to try too many things, which at the end of the day, I think worked out a lot in a lot of cases. And then in other ways, I think we learned where the limit was and maybe just took a, a toe or two over the line, which, you know, at the end, I think is really going to benefit the band in the long run. But uh, for this album, I think it was really uh, a pro, another pro and con situation where we got into a lot of things that we never would have tried otherwise that really benefited the album. And then in a couple of cases we were like, Oh shit, we, 
maybe should have reined that in a bit. But um, you know, that's all. That's, that's that is the that is the conscious choice is to is to take a risk and just and try new things and, and you know and if, and if you know we fuck up here or there then that's part of it. Does it scare you though? Like I, I'm coming from old school, you know, where uh, bands did a major change in style and a lot of fans yeah. got really pissed off. You know, I'm yeah. thinking like Metallica when they did Load or Reload. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, even ACDC, the the diehards when Brian Johnson joined would get all pissed off yeah. because it wasn't Bon Scott. Does it worry you? Yeah. Or do you just? Um, that's what I it think is. The, I think the initial reaction that we got from dropping the first single was a little. Bit, I mean, we were expecting it, but at the same time, when you're actually in the moment and you're starting to see some negative feedback on stuff, it it does hurt. Um, it, it, and again, I take it as a good lesson being that number one, the types of people who are the loudest are always the ones who have a problem with something. Uh, and I think they're the most vocal and, the, and they're the most obvious thing to see first. And then the other thing is that that song is one of those songs where we push the limits. And I think it being that it was the first track that we released off the album, it scared people into thinking that the whole album was going to be in that vein. And it very obviously is not. In fact, you could probably say that about any song we would have released first is that if you were expecting the entire record to sound like that one song, that's obviously not what we did with this album. So, right. um, I, you know, I, I, it's a, it's a risk. We knew we were taking it. We intentionally took it. We learned more than we've ever learned on any album process. We ended up with a bunch of songs we would have never ended up otherwise. And we learned a lot about where the line is for the future and where we want to kind of, you know, uh, rein it in a bit, but at the same time realize that we've, we've never really pushed it this far before. And we, that's something that we should, you know, keep in mind and, and maybe do again here and there. Right. And just for everybody out there who is skeptical, I listened to it about three or four times and it just kept getting better. Um, that's each, that's each the time other I thing. To the songs. I think almost all of my favorite albums of all time have always been albums that I wasn't sure of right away. And Absolutely. it's always, yeah, it's always the stuff that, you know, isn't fundamentally obvious from the first listen. Cause I think that's another thing is that I've found that records that hit me awesome and immediately I tend, I tend, they tend to, wh I get worn out on them quicker because it's not as much of a journey to kind of experience the record and open yourself up to it as you get to know the songs more. Exactly. Uh -uh. But, you know, I really, I really do think at the end of the day, it's a great album and that we, we are all really proud of it. We are also just really as individuals kind of in a point of just wanting to get it out and on, on the road to tour it again, because that's where you always see the most success. Um, it's, I think at the end of the day, our main product is the live show and the CD is really just a vehicle to get us into, into tour mode. So, sure. um, it, it, you know, it's the number one thing that we've, I think the known for over the years is the live concert, you know, and, and that was actually one of the things we were trying to change with this album was trying to find a way to encapsulate the live show a little bit more. And I, again, I think, and I, you know, I would say that we always slightly missed the mark on that with every album. And so it's still one of those like kind of Holy grail things that we're still striving for in the future. But um, yeah, it's, it's all about getting back on the road. Absolutely. I, that live sound is pretty tough to get. I mean, what's the, the, the closest I've ever heard to a live studio album is like Van Halen two, Van Halen one, like just yeah. get in yeah, six, a, six days and 12 songs, you know, that doesn't happen anymore. A, no, I think that's a great example. I honestly think that, that the first Brian Johnson record back in black, one of the biggest selling out rock albums of all time, they were fucking maniacal about recording that album. Uh, Mutt Lang is an absolute genius as far as getting those kind of production values to mirror. The, it's not the sound of a live show. It's the, it's the energy. It's, exactly. the, it's the intensity and the feeling that you get from listening to it makes you feel like the kind of uh, emotion that you would get from a live show, even though, you know, there's no way in hell, you know, any band is ever going to sound that good live. It's about trying to, translate the energy into a recording and, that, and that's the part that i think we actually had more success on this record than we've ever had especially with the first session that we did um with dan weller and that you can actually hear people in the room having fun you can hear the air of the drums there's a, a definitely a wider gamut of sonics going on where the guitars aren't blowing out everything like they normally have and there's actually some organ and some life in there right. and that, that was another kind of like you know change that we made with this album yeah well, it's great sounding. And you got Dee Snyder on it. He's been a fan of the band for a long time, and, and it was it was a 
I'm, I'm happy to say that it was the situation where we had a part that we knew would be perfect for him as opposed to writing a part to try and fit him. Right. It was, it, we've always really been careful of the guests that we have on the record because we like to wait until we have a moment where we're like, this really needs outside help. Who would be perfect for this job? And then we got Ian Thornley or, you know, uh, George Pettit. And in this case, you know, we had the moment where we we're like, we want an evangelistic preacher moment. We want someone to be, you know, declaring their the dedication and love and passion for rock and roll. It probably shouldn't be someone in the band because, you know, it's gonna it's got that kind of sense where someone else could come in and step up to the mic and, and really tell you how it is. And as soon as we realized that, it was it wasn't even it was like a two second discussion. And you know, we were, we were immediately on on the, on the email to D Snyder, and he you know he agreed immediately because, like I said, he's been a fan of the band for a long time. We gave him the general gist of it, and he had it back to us in like a week, and it was perfect. Yeah, I imagine he doesn't take long to record that kind of stuff. No, no. <laughs> he's pretty he's pretty badass. Uh tour plans. You're off to yeah. Europe in Yep. Yep. November, December, yeah. November, December. Well, uh, what about before that? Are you doing any uh Canadian gigs or uh are there plans for a big Canadian tour, US tour? Um, not until next year. Um we're doing uh just a couple of little things. We're playing uh the Labor Day Classic at Hamilton, uh, uh, to Morton's Field, uh, tr- uh, Hamilton Tie Cats versus the Argonauts okay. game on September 3rd. That's the halftime show. And we're also playing Sudbury in September with the Sheepdogs. I can't remember the name of it, the festival, but that's going to be – that's fun because that's almost like a high school reunion of sorts in that we played that festival with them before a couple of years ago. Oh, cool. Um, and that's about it. You know, until we hit the, hit the road in November, there's really a whole lot. But once that starts, it's kind of the beginning of, of, you know, what will end up being, you know, at least a year long cycle. I think we're going to really um, focus in getting back into the studio again, because we've got a ton of material that we've been writing over the summer since we've been off for the whole time. We just, we, we've always been pretty good about making sure that we never skip a beat as far as the writing process is concerned and never take too much time off from that. So we've got an, we basically have another album of songs ready to go, um, at least from a, from a conceptual standpoint and that's something that we'd like to hop into as soon as the is the you know the year-long album cycle is done with this one yeah i would like i'd like to see more bands get into that an album, <laughs> yeah, an album a year i know it's hard to do and it's expensive to do but um it's the it's the yeah. expense i think that really holds people back and it's, it's the struggling record industry and it's um you know it's also like no one's blowing the doors down really you know maybe glorious sons has really made a mark and and that they're being able to get into arenas for the first time. It's probably the first young rock and roll band that's been able to break into arenas in recent, like, memory. I don't know, probably the last decade or so, especially probably. in Canada. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's like, it's just the nature of, like, you know, I think everyone's really struggling in North America. It's the number one reason we go to Europe and the UK. And as soon as you expand your touring palette to, 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 to you know, UK, Europe, um, you know, America, Canada, you, there's just no way to tour that in a year and, and it just it drags out your album cycle and, and makes it so you turn into two or three. So what, what kind of crowds are you playing to in Europe as opposed to in Canada? Um, I think what you're, what we're seeing the majority of uh, in mainland Europe is, is kind of where we were at about five years ago. You know, we're playing, we're playing medium sized clubs, 400, 500 people. Okay. Um, what we're seeing in the UK is, probably closer to where we're at right now in Canada, which is, you know, we're able to do, you know, 800 to a thousand cap in certain areas. And we're, you know, we're, we're about to hopefully convert a bunch of the places that we do 600 and 800 to a thousand caps. So um, it, it, it's taken less time and it's been more kind of, uh, it's been a, a shorter and more steep arc as far as how quickly we've been able to turn, you know, not being uh, not even having been in that market to being something that is on the verge of being profitable um, to, you know, especially with the added cost of flights and crew and everything else, it costs a little bit more over there. We've been able to turn it into something viable pretty quick. Good. Okay. I'm going to ask you some rapid fire questions here. I just want real quick answers. First concert you ever saw. Sharon Lewis and Bram Hamilton place. <laughs> uh, first rock concert you ever saw. Uh, unwritten law blink 182 at the warehouse. Did it change your life? No, 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 I didn't. Which one did? Uh, Jesus, that's a harder question. 
Uh, fuck. I don't know. Nothing I mean, really? I, yeah, there has, I mean, right, like seeing rival sons will do that. There was that good live, you know, um, I'm trying to think of fucking who I can't, I can't I can't, honestly, I, there's a new band called elder there. I saw their show a year ago. And it absolutely floored me. All right. Good enough. Um, uh, first guitar you ever had. There was a white Fender Squire duo Sonic. Okay. What kind of guitar do you play now? Or what's the best play, guitar you play now? The best guitar I play now is a Gibson, a custom shop Gibson SG 1962 reissue and TV yellow. Good Lord. Nicely done. Uh, first gig. First gig was playing at my local skate park in Stony Creek in front of most of my peers in high school. Uh, it was absolutely terrifying. But how did it go? Satisfactory. Place in the world that you want to play a show, but you've never played? Japan, Russia. And who inspired you to play the guitar? Or what inspired you to play the guitar? Kurt Cobain, Nirvana, never mind that whole thing. I was part of that, at least from, you know, that was the right time, right place, right age um, type situation. But uh, I'm so fucking sick of Nirvana now that it's, it's like a pain. It's like a painful answer now because it's just, they've just milked that whole it's the 17th anniversary it's the 18th anniversary of nevermind it's the 20th anniversary of kurt's death it's the 15th yeah. anniversary of incessant it's the 18th anniversary of an unplugged album it's like fuck off but they're doing that with everybody now they are and it's honestly it, crazy. It, it it really truly you know the the people that relentlessly celebrate these artists from 20 years ago and not that they shouldn't be celebrated because they're classic albums and they meant a lot to a lot of people the oversaturation of it the people that are oversaturating it are the same people that are saying how come there's no new young rock bands there's a and, lot of new rock bands and there's a lot of good ones exactly and they have a harder time breaking through when we're going to see guns and roses last tour that isn't the last tour that is the last tour that isn't the last <laughs> tour now it's you know and uh, you know these bands that keep doing these reunion tours at the end of the day it's something everybody wants so you, it's hard to complain about but at the end of the day when you're charging 200 to 400 800 dollars a ticket that's coming out of someone's concert going pocket that can now can't afford to go to the opera house to see rival sons right exactly <laughs> So there's, there's, there needs to be, we need to get reined in a bit here and, and people need to start venturing outside of their comfort zone a little bit to get to these younger bands because it's not like they're not there. They're just getting constantly blown out of the water by, by you know, that 14 3 tour. Exactly. And yeah, that's, that's what I'm trying to do with this website is get people to know that there are some really <laughs> kick-ass young bands out there. I mean, look at Greta Van Fleet is coming up now, Sheepdogs, you guys. Um, I mean, there's there's a lot. Boba Flex. I don't know if you know Boba Flex, but um, no. But there's a band called Temperance Movement who we toured with from the UK, who were phenomenal. They've gotten a little bit of airplane in Canada. Um, that band that I was just talking about earlier, uh, Elder, has probably put out one of the best prog rock uh, albums in the last couple decades. Um, it's not like there isn't stuff there that's exciting and new and, and, and kind of pushing the envelope a little bit as far as what we know is, is a rock album these days. So, um, yeah, people do need to dig a bit. Um, yeah, they're, they're not hard to find either. So um, no, the technology is at everyone's fingertips literally all day. <laughs> <laughs> literally. All right, Jeremy, listen, thank you very much for this. It was fantastic. The album is no. great. Thank um, you. It's a true rocker. <laughs> And, yeah. uh, and I wish you all the best in, uh, in Europe when you head out there. Yeah, thanks, man.